Welcome to the Craft to Career Podcast with Elizabeth Chapel, where every week we dive into how you can turn your craft into a successful career. Get ready to have the career you've always dreamed of. Welcome to episode 26 of the Craft to Career Podcast. I am your host, Elizabeth Chapel of Quilters Candy. This week we have an unusual guest in the best way. We have Dr. Caroline Brookfield. She is a veterinarian. She also did some stand-up comedy. And now she goes and speaks to business owners and businesses on the power of creativity. When I heard of Caroline, I knew I wanted to have her on the show because A, she's done stand-up comedy. You'll hear more about that in the podcast and why that intrigues me. But also, I have seen and felt the power of creativity in my life as an entrepreneur. I, you know, the, to play, to have fun, we don't talk about that very often. And sometimes we get into a rut. And even if we're not in a rut, if we're doing really well, I just know how important it is to take time to play and to have fun and to tap into this side that, that I think gets overlooked. And so I'm really excited to have our guest here today. Before that, I'm going to share our review. It's called Easy to Implement and Helpful by Modern Textiles. Longtime listener, first time reviewer. I'm fairly certain Bobby and I are cut from the same cloth, bedhead hair, and all the coffee. I love the info shared on all the episodes. I feel like you can find items that can be easily changed in your business in every single one of these episodes. From Katie of Modern Textiles. I love that she's a longtime listener, first time reviewer. All was welcome. And she says, Bobby, so that's Geeky Bobbin. And she is referring to episode 14, where Geeky Bobbin was the guest. So if you want to check that out, go check out episode number 14. So thank you again, Katie. And now let me introduce you to our guest, Caroline Brookfield. All right. I am super excited. We have Dr. Caroline Brookfield with us today. And she has such an interesting background and approach to business. So, Carolyn, can you tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah, most people think uh, my current status is a bit weird. So I uh, am a veterinarian by training. So I've been a vet since 1997, which is, I don't even know, 24 years But uh, I've always kind of been drawn back to my creativity, which is how we connected, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's performance and drama and photography. And I just felt through my vet career that there was something kind of missing. And I see this happen with a lot of people, you know, halfway through their career, they feel like they're kind of competent and they are kind of looking around like I should be better. So to make a long story short, I had a job doing public speaking and decided I really loved uh, taking concepts and making them understandable and fun for people. And that took me on a journey about, well, what would I speak to people about and reconnecting with my creativity, which brings me to now where I'm a public speaker and I facilitate workshops and trainings on how people can engage their own unique style of everyday creativity and all the incredible benefits it brings to us both at home and at work. Okay, awesome. And so I also was snooping around your website and saw that you did stand up comedy. Is this true? Yes. So I mean, I'm not really like touring material, but I do Mm -hmm. stand up comedy when I can. Right now during COVID, it's been pretty difficult, but I enjoy doing it. I think I've made $110 in my comedy (laughs) career so far. (laughs) Uh, That's awesome. I mean, there is this odd, that probably super like drew me to you because I will probably never do it, but I have this odd desire to like do stand-up comedy. I don't know why, but it seems oh. like how captivating to stand in front of an audience and to get them to laugh, you know? So, yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious why. Why you think you'd never like? Why you want to do it? Why it draws you? Do you I even have know? No idea. I we watched. There's like a TV show with Jerry Seinfeld, and he mm-hmm. drives. It's like coffee in a cab with oh, comedians. driving in cars with comedians with yeah. um, the guy that helped him write Seinfeld. Yeah. yeah, yes. And he'll meet with all these different stand-up comedians. And the more they just started talking about it, there's something about me when I see something that's difficult and they'll talk about how hard it is mm-hmm. to be a stand-up comedian. I'm like, I could do it. And mm-hmm. so I literally will think that'd be such a great like 
thing to say and that'd be so funny. So it's a very odd thing that I am drawn to. <laughs> it's like a challenge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that ties in. I mean, I feel like it ties in with this creative aspect. And I do feel like often, not just entrepreneurs, but adults in general, we forget to play. So mm-hmm. can you just talk with us about why why did you decide to narrow on that that niche and just tell us all the things about it? Yeah. Um, so I have also been an entrepreneur. I do many things. I also have ADHD, like diagnosed ADHD, which explains a lot. I got diagnosed mm-hmm. in my forties when my son was diagnosed. So, um, so to give a bit of background, I've done many, many things. Um, mm-hmm. and so two of those things have I've had two businesses that I've opened and closed. And, um, when I thought about public speaking, I thought, well, if I want to do this, like as a job, I need to get paid for it because too many times in my business, I see some shiny thing. And I think that looks amazing. And somebody needs that and I'm going to do it. But I hadn't really had the business um, background behind me to really know how do I make it work financially and whether it's viable. So, you know, through any entrepreneur that goes through learning about click funnels and, you know, average client transactions and things like that, um, I became a lot more intentional with my speaking so originally I thought, well, I should speak to veterinarians because that's what I do. So I should bring a message to them. But then I realized there's not that many vets. There's not that many conferences. They also don't pay. It's usually like, you know, a lot of these academic conferences are honorarium. Mm-hmm. They usually are very credential focused. I was like, do I need to get a master's in creativity to talk to vets? So, <laughs> you know, it was like any business I'm sure your listeners can relate to and probably you as well, Elizabeth. It's this iteration of these ideas of like, how do I, you have to let the idea simmer and incubate a little bit. So. Mm-hmm. I was listening actually to a podcast about speaking and the host said, you know, if you don't know what to talk about, you should talk about what people ask you about. And I'd already decided that I couldn't limit my market to just veterinarians Mm -hmm. and I didn't want to. And I thought, well, people are always asking you about how I do things like create a business and, you know, go backpacking or go rock climbing or do stand up comedy. And I thought, like, what's that all about? And that really brought me into a deep dive into creativity because, Creativity is really stepping into the unknown and then hoping that it works out or facing failure. And really, that's that's what we all need more of in life. We need more ability to step into the uncertainty and, and care less about what other people think and just go ahead and share our unique creativity with the world, which is so hard. Right. I know it sounds so easy when you say it, but like, it's not, you know? No. Okay, the ADHD thing is intriguing to me. I am definitely <laughs> undiagnosed, but the more I talk with creatives, it keeps popping up. I'm reading articles. It's, it runs in my family, and mm. I'm like, I, I think I might. So what is this mm. correlation? Like, do you think that there's even an article called, like, what is it? The ADHD, the entrepreneur superpower. Mm. And I love that. I'm like, oh, superpower. But um, mm. do you think that there's some kind of correlation between ADHD and that, like, jumping into things and not really being too nervous? Of, I don't know. Yeah, I definitely do. And, I, you know, I, I've done a lot of reading myself about ADHD, but I'm certainly not, like, you know, a, a psychologist. But my my understanding with ADHD is there's a lot of good things. There's also a lot of things that could be really challenging. In my case, I don't mind sharing, my concern was um, – emotional dysregulation. Like I would hit the roof over the smallest things. And um, Mm -hmm. that was really a struggle for me and my family. And in women, especially as they're adults, ADHD often manifests as anxiety and depression. And so I had some symptoms of that, um, some mild symptoms of that. I'm also hypothyroid. So I mean, not that, you know, maybe this is TMI, I don't know for your listeners, but um, it was a, it was a journey. And then when my son, you know, the funny story is, so, so we're sitting there with my son, in the psychologist appointment where she's kind of explaining her results of the psychoeducational assessment. And she says, um, well, he doesn't like to learn something unless he knows why he's learning it. And I mm-hmm. just looked at her and I said, well, isn't that everybody? <laughs> and she right? said, no, some people will learn even when they don't know why they're learning it. And I looked at my husband and he's just like staring straight ahead. Like he's not, I'm not engaging. And I said, well, people, those people are stupid. Why would you do that? (laughs) And I look at my husband. He's still like looking straight ahead. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, 
oh, this is a bit of a clue here. <laughs> but anyway, to answer your question about that, so yes, I think, so ADHD, you know, with the lack of dopamine, very impulsive seeking, you know, very, uh, like a lack of executive function, which can manifest as poor organization. It can manifest as like emotional dysregulation in my case, because you don't have that inhibiting action to stop you from losing your cool um, or to say, no, we only, you know, people call it attention deficit, but really I like it when people say it's an overabundance of attention Mm -hmm. because it's almost like, you know, you know, that joke of like you have 50 tabs open and you don't know where the sound's coming from. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, a lot of times people say ADHD is like that, where most people can say, no, I only want these two tabs open. But with ADHD, you don't have that um, inhibition to be able to filter out all of the input. So it can be very distracting. And that's why people with ADHD are often like jumping around because they're seeing all the things or, you know, noise will sometimes bother them or, or, you know, distractions. They can't do their work because there's too much to distract them. So, um, in a long-winded way, uh, I, I think, yes, I think a lot of entrepreneurs are drawn, uh, or a lot of people with ADHD are drawn to being an entrepreneur because they can kind of do their own thing. They have that drive to try different things and try new things. Sometimes they don't fit in well to a traditional working environment. Um, mm-hmm. So that's my thoughts. I don't know. I kind of rambled there a little bit. I, I well, I'm sitting here out. listening. <laughs> no way. No, I love this. I'm sitting here listening and I'm just super fascinated because it's like, wow, that's describing me to a T. This is mm. a little creepy, but um, mm. that's very fascinating. But, you know, and I've interviewed a few people who are super put together and I don't think they have ADHD and yet they're successful as a creative entrepreneur. Mm. And so, I mean, it, when you talk with people, do you tap into, like, how, how do you just help someone tap into that creativity? Do you like turn on your music and dance every day or what does that look like? Yeah, I think, so I think because of my ADHD, you know, going back to that, cause we were talking about that, one of the benefits of it. And, you know, when you mentioned the superpower, there's a lot of pushback on that because it makes it sound like it's this thing that you want and it's desirable, but it does have a lot of negative um, emotional you know, components to it. So it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. But um, in in the good parts of it for me is I get bored easily. So I try to make things simple and pertinent and know why you're learning them. Mm -hmm. And so I talk about five easy habits. I'm not great at doing like six steps every day for 15 minutes or whatever, or scheduling in my calendar, like forget it. I don't schedule things. Same, same. Unless there's like accountability for someone like you for our podcast recording, of course I'll be there. But if I put like write a blog post at 10 a.m., I'm like, I don't want to do that at 10 (laughs) a.m. Forget it. No, thanks. (laughs) Yep. Exactly. So, so I talk about habits, which is more for me about tying um, these habits into daily activities. So, I have a a book coming out in December and I talk about these five habits that spell the word dance, which is funny that you said you just Mm -hmm. get up and dance because yes, you could just get up and dance. And for people who are feeling not creative, and I know that a lot of your listeners are very creative, but if they're feeling like they need to do something different or they want to engage their creativity, we all have creativity. We just need to create the environment for it to thrive which is not mm. easy to do in our, you know, busy focused world. So the, the dance acronym stands for five habits. And the first one is daydreaming, you know, put down your phone, don't just stand in line and like, look on your phone, like just look around and think about something interesting. Um, think about something fantastical. Research has shown that people who daydream about like, um, you know, storylines that are kind of fantastical being a princess or whatever, or different and envi- different, uh, uh, universe, uh, is the most productive daydreaming as opposed to just like, you know, dwelling on that email you got. Yeah. Let's say there's someone who is so not used to daydreaming for me. It's almost like a given that I'm going to daydream. I have to not, <laughs> you know, but, um, <laughs> but for others who, who struggle with that, is there like a, if you're struggling to figure out how to do this, first try mm-hmm. to blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Yeah. And it's interesting because we do spend 30 to 40% of our day mind wandering. Um, everybody does. So just don't okay. realize it half the time. So you might just be, maybe you're more of a 50 percenter. I don't know. Or maybe you're just more attuned to it. Um, but yeah, yeah I'm very I think, self-aware. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, you're so self-aware. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> but for people who are like struggle with that, I think what I do is I pair it to something. So like I'll make myself some tea in the morning and I use that. I definitely do not pick up my phone when I'm having my tea or eating my breakfast as much as I want to, you know, mm -hmm. um, I try to just look out the window, watch the birds. Um, some, you know, anytime you have an opportunity to just be somewhere and let your mind wander, I think trying to think about something interesting, like let's say you're in line at the bank and normally most people would pull out the phone and start like checking, you know, Facebook or something like that like leave your phone in your pocket or your purse and just like imagine somebody's life. You know, sometimes one of the things I find fun is I watch someone who's either very elderly or very young and I try to imagine them as the opposite. So if I see like a very elderly person, I'm just like, I wonder what they were like as a kid and how their life was. And, you know, did they like, you know, were they that bad kid that, you know, the rebel or were they, you know, the, the bookworm or something. So those are some ideas to start with. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with stop filling our day completely with busy work. Yes. And phones. I mean, it's such a time suck. It's, uh, we just need to set them down and I'm talking to myself as well here. Mm -hmm. Same. But I think actually you and I are somewhat kindred spirits. The way that you think, I just, this is so funny. I, I'm always so curious about stuff. Like I'll look at someone or even a commercial. If there's a little bug crawling in a hole, I'm like, ooh, what's in the hole? My husband's like, oh, that's so cute. I'm like, that's a little <laughs> odd. Let's be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I think that's probably why you're, you do, you're doing what you're doing, right? I think that's one of the things with um, entrepreneurs and creatives is that, you know, desire to keep doing and learning and curiosity about the world, I think that's very conducive to creativity. Yeah, yeah, it is. So we've got the D, which is yep. daydream. Uh, the second one is A for ambiguity. So learning to be more comfortable with ambiguity because when we're doing something creative, we don't really know how it's going to turn out. Like when you're doing a quilt, as much as you probably have a pattern and an idea, I'm assuming I don't quilt, so I'm sorry if I'm mm -hmm. getting this wrong, but I would assume that it could turn out differently or maybe you change your mind mm -hmm. um, before you start. Is that is that about right? Uh, yeah. I mean, there's some programs you can use that you can see pretty well what it'll look like, but as far as a release, how is, how's it going to be received or what are people going to think about this? Mm -hmm. I would think that might, I don't know if that might be where it would apply. Right. Yeah. So this idea of not knowing how people are going to respond or that's a, a key element of creativity. And again, with the phones, not to, you know, vilify phones completely, but, um, you know, we have no, we have no reason to sit in ambiguity anymore. We can just research something and get po probably the wrong answer mm. half the time. But um, mm -hmm. that's, that's sitting in the space of not knowing. So things like, um, you know, I'm doing a dare every week uh, for kind of the lead up to my book launch. And one of the dares, for instance, this month, so this month is ambiguity month, is to just go to the barista and say, just make me something you think I might like. And mm, that's <laughs> the, fun. Yeah, the barista did not like it when I did it. <laughs> They're like, no, tell me what to do. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, just pick me something. She's like, hot or cold? Or I'm like, anything, just whatever. <laughs> Uh, you know the funny thing, Elizabeth? She picked me a caramel macchiato, which is what I always get. I was oh, like, really? oh, man. <laughs> Be creative. Fail. Epic fail. Yeah. <laughs> I just have a caramel <laughs> macchiato face, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Or maybe it's what everyone likes. I don't know. Exactly. Safe. It's a safe choice, right? Right. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ambiguity. And yep. then N. And it's for novelty. So, uh, you know, in all of my kind of what I talk about is rooted in research and data because of my veterinary background and my research background, I like to make sure that I'm, you know, trying to honor that if there is research in a domain that we, I can share that, which, because, you know, research is always helpful. And there's a lot of research showing the importance of things like diversity and diversity of, um, of different worldviews and a team can help produce better results. I call it like, you know, imagine that your brain's like a universe full of stars and, mm -hmm. If you do the same thing and always get a caramel macchiato, you're going to have a tiny little universe with tiny little stars that are all shoved close together. So you're not going to get a lot of great um, linking of ideas because they're all so clustered close together. But the wider the diversity of experiences, relationships, knowledge that you have, your universe expands. And then I think about this little rocket ship like flying around the universe 
And you don't know that this is happening. This is like your default mode network when you're daydreaming. It's part of your brain that's like very active and linking concepts. And so the more the, the wider your universe, the more diversity that the rocket ship can find, which is going to give you more likely a really insightful aha. Even if you don't realize it's happening, you know, when you get an aha mm -hmm. moment, you don't know where it came from. That's where it came from. So it's important so, to have that. Yeah. Is this like, so I'm thinking like of a mastermind or the word synergy, you know, one plus one equals three. Is this meaning working with other people or what would it look like? It looks like any, it just, it looks like anything. So I think that, you know, a diver, you know, diversity and inclusion is very helpful for creativity working with, I think the struggle is, um, it should be a, a difference of worldview. So it doesn't matter if you have racial or demographic diversity, if everybody thinks the same way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it does matter. It matters in many other ways. But for creativity specifically, you need to have people with very different worldviews. So for instance, uh, there was a study that showed that, I, that CEOs who had lived abroad had higher creativity than CEOs that had not mm -hmm. lived abroad. So people talk about things like traveling, which I know is hard right now. Right. But you can travel on the internet, you can go to ethnic um, restaurants or different, make friends from different cultures, help out with an immigrant society, you can read books that you wouldn't normally read, um, take a course on something. So I took a course on f photographing the Milky Way, because I like photography, mm -hmm. and the Milky Way photos are beautiful. And halfway through this course, I'm like, I am not getting up at two o'clock in the morning to drive an hour <laughs> out to the mountains. Like, it's not, it's not happening. Right. It's just not. <laughs> But I really love the course. So, you know, sometimes <laughs> right. just learning something or meeting somebody just for the sake of expanding your worldview is very helpful for creativity. Okay. So this is really cool. So just spending time, I guess it just broadens your, you know, like when you go to another country and you think, wow, I thought everything was like this, but it's not. I guess it can, I, okay, it makes sense. Expands your, your mind and your creative. Well, yeah, and you see people doing different things. Like uh, this might be a weird example, but when I went backpacking and I was in Australia, I got addicted to flavor tuna. Like as a backpacker, it was great. Just bought a box of crackers and these small cans of flavor tuna. This is like mm -hmm. in the late 90s. And we didn't have it in Canada. I don't know if you had it in the US then. And we have it everywhere now. But, right, you, know, yeah. you know, had I been an entrepreneur and a tuna magnate, I could have been like, oh, we should have flavor tuna, you know, and that... Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah. it's sometimes about learning how other people do things and creativity is, is always about like breaking or blending or combining ideas. And so the more ideas you're exposed to, the more likely you're going to be able to incorporate those ideas into something that works for you. And super applicable to my listeners too, especially it's a lot of quilters and mm -hmm. when they're going to design a quilt pattern you want to look anywhere but at other people's quilts. You know, if you go out into the world, you start seeing all these different things and you get ideas. And so very, very applicable there. That's cool. Did you say you shouldn't look at other people's quilts? You're saying you should look at different kinds of patterns? Or yeah, is... yeah. Like oh. often, so yeah, when people look at other people's quilts, they'll try to like, well, I don't want to copy them. But if you're looking at them, you're going to be thinking about it. But mm -hmm. some of my best quilt ideas come from out in the world, in nature, a floor that I see or, you know, different oh. things that are not quilts. So I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So next we've got C. Is that right? Yes. yes. You like this one. So we already talked about it a little bit. C is for curiosity. Mm -hmm. So uh, to be curious is to be humble and realize you don't know the answer to something. It also requires a lot of um, mindfulness to know, to notice that, you know, bug crawling in the hole or whatever. And to think, um, you know, what don't, what don't I know about this versus thinking, you know, all the answers. So being curious and asking lots of questions will help to catalyze your own creativity. Hmm. And do you find that some people struggle with that more than others? Oh, yeah. I mean, I see it in my vet work all the time, both on the vet side and the and the client side, or the, pay, the, the owner side. You know, they think they know the answer. And, you know, on both sides, there's this rigidity as opposed to being curious. Like, well, why would you think that? And, you know, so many times I've gotten curious with a, a veterinary client and found out something that had I just assumed what I thought I knew would have taken me on a completely different course for my diagnosis and treatment. So, um, hmm. yeah, so it's really 
important. Yeah. And thinking, I mean, and we won't go too deep into this hole because it could get a hot topic, but even <laughs> politically, like if people could mm-hmm. just someone who thinks mm-hmm. differently, if you could, instead of no, they're wrong, ask, why would they think that way? Mm-hmm. Why, you know, and just mm-hmm. letting yourself be open to learning why I think mm-hmm. that could be really helpful to you know, mend some bridges and whatnot, but we won't go too far into that. (laughs) No, I agree with you. And I think that that goes for anything, whether it's politically or different cultures or different religions or whatever the case, Mm -hmm. like trying to, trying to be curious. And unfortunately we react so emotionally to topics like that because they're so important to us. And if we can only take time to, you know, take a deep breath and try to delay our emotional reaction and just be curious, I think that I agree. I think people would have more understanding, but we don't have to be curious anymore because we can just go on our phones or internet and find somebody who agrees with us and then be vindicated in our outrage, right? So, Right. Bolster us up that, no, this is right because we all believe this. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do like that, that creative one. And then E... E is for edit later. I couldn't find one word for that. But um, editing later is something that I think your quilters will probably um, resonate with because editing later is about not filtering your ideas, not criticizing your own ideas before you've actually even articulated them. So in creative thought, there's kind of two different ways. There's divergent and convergent. So divergent is the like, what can I make my, what, what pattern am I going to choose for my quilt today? Or what theme am I going to use? So that would be divergent. There's many, many answers. And that's where mm-hmm. a lot of people think of creativity, like the sky's the limit. Yeah. And then there's convergent thinking, which is equally important, but that's about filtering things down. Like, okay, well, I'm going to choose this pattern. or I'm going to choose this color combination or whatever. But most people do them at the same time. So they'll think of an idea that, no, I didn't want to do that. Or, oh, no, the color is not going to look good together. Um, or something like that. But the important thing is when you're creating ideas is to allow yourself to create without judgment. And then once you have your ideas to sit down and say, okay, you know, which ones are the most viable or which ones am I going to use moving forward? Okay. So being able to let yourself make some crappy stuff and just sit with that and not worry about it being perfect. Is that kind of, if I rephrase it or no? Yeah, or even, I mean, I don't know at what stage, like, would it be in the creation stage or the drawing the pattern stage or the, you know, choosing your color combination stage? It's just a a habit of trying not to think. I mean, in a meeting, it would maybe be a better example. Like, people think of an idea and they're like, oh, that's kind of dumb or we've never done that before or they'll think that's Mm -hmm. stupid before they even articulate their idea. So it's important to be like a safe space to share any idea. Like, no idea is a bad idea in the divergent phase, but there are very bad ideas. The mm-hmm. idea is that you filter them out in the convergent stage because often the bad idea is what turns into be the good idea. So uh, I have a great example for this if you want to hear it. Yeah. So <clears throat> there was, this was in my creative problem solving course. One of the instructors told me this story and it was about a factory uh, that used to sell glasses like drinking glasses. Um, the problem was mm-hmm. their production was really, really slow because the people on the floor, this is back before the internet, they would read the newspaper instead of wrapping the glasses. So it would take forever to pack these glasses. And so they brainstormed about what they could do. And, you know, they went along this idea of no idea is a bad idea. And so finally someone blurted out, well, let's just poke their eyes out so they can't see the paper. <laughs> which is a bad idea, (laughs) right? (laughs) But that was the catalyst for the idea to hire visually impaired employees who not only couldn't read the newspaper, but had such a strong tactile sense that they broke way less glasses. They were so much faster and their production Mm. improved and they got access to government grants to help people with disabilities. So that's the kind of idea I'm talking about. Like it's important to get the bad ideas out because that might not be the bad idea, but it might give you an idea that might be the idea that works. That is a really cool example. Hasn't it? Okay. I like that. Now that's the one that I'm going to have to sit with and like think about to how can I apply that one, you know? Yes. So your book comes out in December. Yep. Hopefully. I didn't even know. What's it called? I don't know yet. (laughs) Okay. Is it self-published or do you have like a, a company? No, I am going to be self-publishing it, which I'm still navigating that process. So my last, I kind of sent my kind of last revisions back to my editor. So hopefully 
there won't be too many more revisions. And then it's the process of navigating the whole publishing world, which is an exercise and novelty for me. I really, <laughs> yeah. and ambiguity, right? Yep, exactly. And curiosity. <laughs> well, that's exciting. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. I'll be sure to yeah. share that when it comes out. Thank you. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the episode that you interviewed um, someone who had self-published a quilting book recently. Yeah. Yeah. So I really enjoy, I was really enjoying listening to that and her journey of um, how she decided to publish her book and, uh, and how to create it. So thank you for that. Yeah, you're welcome. Most it's interesting. Most people I know lately who are publishing are self-publishing. And Mm -hmm. so it intrigues me. So that's I'm kind of excited to hear your story about that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm still figuring it. I think the reason is that traditional publishers, it's kind of, my impression is, unless you have a very large audience already or a large following or you're a celebrity, mm-hmm. um, it's very difficult to get a traditional publishing deal um, right. to begin with. And then, you know, if you're self-publishing, you also have more control over how to market it and you know, they might say, oh, you can't call it this, you have to call it that. So some of it's creative freedom, but I think a lot of it is also just the reality of the publishing business these days is is what I understand anyway. Yeah, you have the ability to make it look how you want and to just do it, to not wait for someone to say, no, yes, you can just jump in and write your book, you know? Exactly. Yes. So I am curious, I saw on your website that you talk about decision making and creativity. Mm-hmm. So the amount of decisions that an entrepreneur has to make can mm-hmm. honestly, it can be debilitating. It can stop mm-hmm. people from moving forward. So can you share with us how creativity helps with decision making? Yes. So I think the, when I talk about decision making and creativity, a lot of it connects back to this sense of ambiguity. So, and you know, one of the terms that com- the terms confuse me. So when we talk about ambiguity, it's a state of the world. It's inert. It's just like the wall is ambiguous, but it creates mm-hmm. a sense of like a feeling of uncertainty in us. So that's the emotion that ambigu- ambiguity prompts. And <clears throat> so what's fascinating is that when we're in a state of uncertainty, because there's something ambiguous and it doesn't even have to be something we recognize. It could be something subconscious that we see that, that we can't really figure out. It, creates like a threat-like response. So we see any ambiguity as a threat and it doesn't have to be bad. So ambiguity could be like, is that a cat or a cougar? You know, like mm-hmm. that could be bad ambiguity. Mm-hmm. Or it could be your boss who normally yells at you, brings you a cake and a tea and says, how is it going with the project? Can I do something for you? Like that's ambiguous as well, yep. which causes a threat-like response. And then when we feel that threat response and that uncertainty, we are pushed into making a decision very rapidly. First, we start collecting information from the environment. So we scan with our hearing and our sight, and then we're pushed into making a decision, which is usually a decision that we've always made, a status quo decision. Hmm. So if we want to do something new and different and we're feeling uncertain, it's very difficult to kind of hack that instinct for survival, because really, if it's worked for thousands of years, like, why would you change it if it's threatening Mm -hmm. your survival? Um, But most cases, we're not worried about that these days. We're trying to make decisions for our business, for our creativity. So when we exercise creativity in any domain, whether it's making a meal or um, choosing an outfit or quilting or, you know, doodling on a piece of paper, we're engaging that ability to step into uncertainty and make a decision anyway. So I believe that it's like a boot camp. So if we use our own creativity, we get this kind of muscle memory of stepping into uncertainty and feeling confident despite not knowing the answer. So that when something pops up in our business or our life, then we are like, oh, okay, yeah, I see this one coming. You know, this is, I've done this before when I was doodling and I didn't know what to write or something. So this is really fascinating. So is it kind of like, trying something new feels uncomfortable and that in our brains is triggering this is dangerous don't do that and so creativity kind of like you said a boot camp helps you just get more familiar with this unknown this new territory is that right yeah and I haven't seen a lot of research that proves like a causation where like creativity causes you to be more comfortable in an uncertainty, but there are definitely high correlations. So some work out of Australia has shown that if you are 
creative, you are also more likely to be tolerant of ambiguity and comfortable in uncertainty. And you're also mm. more likely to be more resilient um, because really what is resilience except for stepping into the unknown, failing and doing it again, which is really the definition of True. creativity, right? So. Oh, this is so fascinating. I Isn't am it? loving this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Like, it is so cool. You need to write books and books. Like, I want all the research. <laughs> well, I have to tell you, so because of my, well, my idiot, like, my worst nightmare is filing or putting things away. Like, yeah. I just cannot deal. And so when I wrote my book, I had all my references, like, just like, you know, Smith 2020 or whatever. And I was like, oh, God, the references, which I always hated doing when I was in school and in right? research. And my editor, I said, how do you want the references? Do I need to put them in like APA format for you or whatever? And she's like, oh, that's okay. Just give me the, you know, the whatever the re reference and I'll do it. I was like, what? <laughs> I love you. You're an angel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I put Where all of the articles in a folder and she's going to do it. And I was like, this is like. Christmas come early for me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I will say in my business, there are certain things that I, I've hired a few people to help with, which is really organizational stuff because mm. it's not my strong suit. But mm -hmm. now there's other aspects of my life, like volunteering at my kid's school. I'm like, I don't want to do that. Who can I hire? I'm like, well, that doesn't work that way all the time, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish, well, you, could, I wish. you might you might have some fear of judgment of others from that <laughs> yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, this is true. So if you could share one tip with a brand new entrepreneur, what would that be? With respect to how to be more creative in their business, you mean? Or yeah, I guess just it, working with different entrepreneurs, with different business people. If you knew someone was starting or wanting to start an entrepreneur or a creative business. What's like a nugget of truth or something that you've seen over and over again that like, you know, just think about this. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, and I don't know for your listeners if they struggle with this, but I see a lot of entrepreneurs getting bogged down in the planning and the perfection. Like, oh, I've got to spend six months writing a business plan and, you know, I need to know what the outcome is going to be before I do this. And I'm a big fan of, I believe it's a, is it Japanese method, the Toyota, where it's like you don't spend three years planning and then execute, you just start and then you continue mm -hmm. to iterate. So I think I would say to entrepreneurs, don't be afraid with proper risk evaluation right. to try something and see. Like that was something I learned as a business owner. I was really bad when I owned, I owned a jewelry business and I would like, you know, buy a whole like collection and I'm like, I should just put the photos up and see if anybody wants to buy it first, you know, before I go out mm. and buy. So mm -hmm. I think um, balancing this sense of like minimizing your financial risk as much as possible, um, but also not being afraid to try what you think is right, uh, you know, without, mm -hmm. without worrying about, you're not going to lose the business if you you know, invest a small amount of money in something and try something versus like mortgaging your house on something that you don't know what the outcome right. is going to be. So I think it's that balance of taking risks, um, but smart risks, but not being afraid mm -hmm. to just take action and moving the forward. Because that whole idea of um, the best time to start was 20, what is it, that thing? The best time yeah, to plan 10 a Yeah, 10 years ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. But the second best time is today. So, yep. you know, and, and I think that, you know, that's not one nugget. But the other thing is um, a big thing that I find helpful with creativity and especially with my stand-up uh, hobby is uh, not to be so worried about what other people think. Because what you think they're thinking is probably not really what they're thinking. And also, they don't really think about you that much anyway. So yeah. I would say just do what feels right to you, but manage the risk and just take action. Yeah, that's powerful. I wish there was like, which is, no, I don't really wish. Okay, I was going to say, I wish there was like a magic wand that could take away the care of caring about other people. But I, I've well, learned over and over again, you've got to go through that. You've got to mm -hmm. learn it for yourself, you know, and experience that. But um, but that is a very real, real thing. Honestly, sometimes I think the biggest risks people take in their business are the fear of people aren't going to like it. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, just put it out there, you know, let's just do mm -hmm. this. And so, yeah, I like that. Yeah, so. I think I, I experienced that when I had my jewelry business and I was working as a vet, I wouldn't tell people about my jewelry business at work because I thought they would think it was weird. I thought they would think like, why do you have a jewelry business when you're a vet? But when I, 
let go of that fear and I started sharing it. The great thing about creativity is that it's contagious. And there were people that would kind of look at me puzzled and then say, okay, so anyway, (laughs) that's more about them than about me. But so many Mm -hmm. people would come back to me months later and say, you know, you told me you did a jewelry business. I was like, I've always wanted to try quilting and I made this quilt and then I sold it and it was incredible. And I'm so glad I did. So I think, um, you know, the the contagiousness of creativity is something that is underestimated and we need it. We need to be creative. It's our human, human elemental gift. Yeah. Well, and I hadn't really thought about the contagiousness of it, but you're right. Even seeing your, like your bio or whatever, where you did stand up comedy, I'm like, that's right. That would be kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's contagious. Like you, you got to do it, Elizabeth. I, you know, you I'm going to just try it sometime. Who ca- you know, here we go. Who cares if I fall Who on my cares? face and it goes terribly? Who cares? I'll go somewhere where no one knows me. <laughs> well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that helps me. I'm like, what do I care about all these drunk people? What they think about me? You know, like, <laughs> I mean, of right. course I do care. I mean, I care where I'm deeply right, ingrained we're human. evolutionarily to care because if we, you know, at one point, if we um, didn't fit in, we'd be de- dead, right? We'd be right. kicked out of the tribe, but it's an outdated survival mechanism. And now I feel like it's the opposite. It's the people who stand out and who take a chance to share their truth that are the ones that people sit up and take notice of. And, you know, because yeah. I've got a research background, I see life, I hate statistics, but I see life as the bell curve in every way. So some things are going to fail, some things are going to like knock it out of the park, but most things will be in between. And I feel like that's for other people. Like there's always going to be the haters. If you do anything, you know, look at people like Justin Bieber or Madonna or very celebrity. There's Mm -hmm. always the haters. And then there's the people who like just love, love, love you. And then most people are in between. So I feel like if I see life as a bell curve, when I see the people who are like, oh, you sucked or whatever, which doesn't really happen. But if it does, then you're like, oh, you're that part of the bell curve. Okay, well, that's okay. There you are. I like yeah. that. Oh, you're that part of the bell curve. Well, good. We need that. So <laughs> there's going to be someone exactly. there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you're expecting it, you, I feel like it's less impactful. Yeah. And honest, okay, this is so random. And if you haven't seen this, you'll, well, you'll, you should think about watching it. You don't have to, but anyways, on Netflix, oh. there's a show called My Octopus Teacher. Oh. And it's this guy who goes and goes diving every day and brings a little camera with him and he becomes friends with a little octopus and watches its life and captures it playing and most of the time it's working 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 but here's this octopus and it shows him playing and I just for whatever reason love that I'm like even fish have to play like we all have to take time out to daydream or Mm -hmm. or play and just I don't know why it's necessary, but I'm grateful because it's fun. You know, it's good for us and we need it. It's this fun little gift that we get to. Well, we should. If we don't, we burn out and, you know, a little cranky. I love it. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. That sounds really cool. The octopus. uh, Yeah. Yeah. If you hate it, then, no. well, just just disregard it. it, But (laughs) unless like, I mean, I can't watch like, what was that thing? The Tiger King? Like I never watched that because that's exploitation of animals. Like I just, I, you know, because of my background, I can't, there's certain things I can't watch with animals, but if it's respectful and not disturbing the environment, of course, I find it. Oh, you'll love it. That's right. I hadn't even put that to the vet thing. No, I was bawling during this, which is kind of embarrassing to admit, but I'm crying like, this is so beautiful. I mean, it was... (laughs) So, yeah, well, no, I, and I love what out. you said about play. It is so important. And I think, you know, going back to so many people get because, you know, we graduate and we do the thing where, you know, we want to do for our life and we're head down. You know, I talk about plowing a field like I'm such a hard worker. And sometimes I think I'm like plowing a field and I'm doing it fast and effectively. But then I look up and I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm in the wrong field. You know? mm-hmm. And I think yep. I think that playing really helps you kind of like take a break from that and help you kind of see what's important to you and realize that we don't have to be go, go, go all the time. And sometimes when we're doing nothing, which feels like it's so unpredictable, we're actually doing the most important work, which is allowing our creativity to simmer and daydream and put all the concepts together that could end up being the thing that, you know, helps us launch into a a life that's more fulfilling. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, 
creatives, whether it's quilter or whatever, I mean, writers, there's a term for it, writer's block, but mm-hmm. quilters have it too. A designer, mm-hmm. whether it's fabric or a quilt pattern, I do not know a quilt pattern designer who hasn't been like, I'm in a funk right now. I don't mm-hmm. have my sojo. We call it, I, I need my sojo back instead of mojo. Oh, why but, sojo? Um, What's the S for? Instead of mojo, it's for sewing, you know. Sewing. So, oh, sojo. sojo. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yep. So creative. Uh huh. <laughs> and yeah. So, I mean, I think, and it's just stepping away and playing and being okay with like, you don't have to be productive and always producing that mm-hmm. it's beneficial and necessary to take a break. So, when you're feeling that, or even before you feel that, be conscientious mm-hmm. of taking a break, you know? Yeah. And one of the things that makes me think of is, um, sometimes I'll try something creative that like artistic, I'm not, I'm not gifted artistically. So like during COVID, I took a painting online thing and made this um, uh, lighthouse painting. Mm -hmm. It's like a tutorial and you go through the video and she shows you how to do it. And at the end I was like, Oh, I am amazed that I, like it looked pretty good except for my lighthouse was totally leaning. Like it looked like (laughs) it was going to fall into the ocean and there's something so liberating about doing something badly when you're used mm-hmm. to doing something well all the time that I think even that can catalyze. And that kind of goes back to that um, editing later idea is just in the fear of judgment. Like sometimes doing something bad on purpose, I think, gets your juices flowing or something that you know is not going to look good because you realize it doesn't matter anyway. Mm-hmm. And then maybe that will be the bad idea that gives you a good idea to get you out of your sojo. Yeah. Possibly. And trying something new, stretching your creative muscles a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. it never hurts. It all is always beneficial in some way or another. It circles back and helps you out. Yeah. And one of the exercises that I do and like creative problem solving is, um, which is common among creative problem solving facilitators is to ask uh, for ideas that will get you fired. Mm. Right. So it's like the, the poking your eyes out example with the glass manufacturer. So for quilters, I wonder if when you're in a block, if just trying to make the most hideous, ugly pattern you can like think that. of, like it might even get you out of your funk because it's funny, <laughs> right. right? Like if you challenge yourself to make the ugliest quilt, yes, I well, don't you think this. it would be funny? At the I'm end of totally the- doing this. <laughs> Do it. Oh, I'd love to see it. <laughs> and what would get you fired? I love that. Like, what would be yeah. the absolute worst thing I could do for my customers? Like, just yeah. to go down that hole of like, hmm, well, this and this and this, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And they're probably, they probably would be bad ideas. But right. in those bad ideas, you might be like, well, actually, that mm-hmm. gives me another idea. So. I'm really liking that. That's a fun one. <laughs> well, this has been so fun. Thank you so much for being here on the Craft a Career Podcast. If our listeners want to find you, where where can they find you? Uh, probably the easiest place is on my website at carolinebrookfield.com. Um, I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn and Instagram. And mm-hmm. uh, I've loved this conversation, Elizabeth. I just love talking to you about your creativity and ADHD and just like taking the conversation where it goes let it let it yeah be creative right yes letting it be ambiguous is my using that term right yeah no that's right you are you are using it right yes of course <laughs> okay perfect perfect well this is yes thank you so much for being here and we'll be sure to look out for your book that's coming out later this year or early next year Great. I hope you you enjoyed hearing from Dr. Caroline Brookfield as much as I did. She was just a pleasure to chat with. It was so insightful. I mean, I feel like I geeked out a little bit over some of the stuff she was talking about. It was just awesome. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave a review, tap the five-star review. Let me know what you're enjoying and what you want to hear more of. And next week on the podcast, it will be just me, and I am going to be talking about launching a pattern, best practices for launching a pattern, doing one versus two pattern launch, all the things. If there is a topic of business, whether it's quilt related or just overall, feel free to leave that in the reviews because I will take a look and I definitely want to cover things that my listeners are interested in. In fact, a lot of the topics that are just me speaking come from people reaching out and saying, hey, I'd love to hear about this. So that's where next week's topic is coming from. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being a part of the Craft to Career community. And I will see you next week.